life. Uh, and one of the themes that continually comes up from the public when they're asked of you is that there a demand for new information, a demand for proper information about the EU referendum. What would be the effects on immigration? What would be the effects on house prizes? What would be the effects on lawmaking potential? And when the established political class tries to give that information, the public seem to be quite confused. And you seem to get quite a plausible set of, in, uh, of explanations to why, uh, as to why uh, uh, a Brexit would be disastrous or to why Brexit would be uh, advantageous. And there seems to be a cognitive dissonance. The public don't really know how to weigh this up. And so one of the ways that this is, main this is uh, manifest, I think, is in trying to read the opinion polls. Now, there was an Alumni Association event uh, just over a year ago uh, on the, uh, uh, the run-up to the general election. Uh, that was in Manchester. I spoke at that event. I'm going to be even more cautious than I was that, at that point about reading the polls, but I'll give you a reason for why you need to be very cautious when you're looking at the polls right now. There has been some movement in, in recent times in the polls, apparently. <coughs> Excuse me, but what's driving, what's driving uh, uh, the difficulty in reading the polls is that the methodologies of the polling companies looks to be giving different results. And if you thought the polling industry had a crisis after the general election, they might have an even bigger one after the EU referendum. <coughs> but the motivations of the people on either side seems to, see, seems to be, add to the difficulty in reading it. Uh, and certainly, some of the people in favour of leaving the EU, it's the reason why they became exercised in politics in the first place. Uh, and they are... Uh, uh, on average, much more certain to vote than some of the people who are in favour of remaining in the EU. And that means that you can't read this, the remain, leave figures as, uh, you know, uh, uh, on their own. You've got to factor in. You've got to factor in certain certainty to vote. And one of the things we know about the age profiles, the class profiles, uh, uh, the educational profiles of uh, individuals might make them more likely to vote in any election, not least a... Uh, uh, not least a referendum uh, uh, um, uh, than, uh, th than other people, and the issue salience, how important is it to those people? And that means that the polls are, I think, quite misleading right now. Uh, uh, um, uh, YouGov, which is the organisation which probably has the closest gap between Remain and Stay at the moment, have just, in, uh, have just uh, uh, introduced a tool to their website with a ready reckoner for turnout. You have to plug in a turnout of around 71% for a referendum in order for them to give a decisive remain victory. And, that, uh, and yet their data is showing there is a slight remain lead. Um, uh, and, and so that would, that would indicate um, that nobody knows. And more events like this, and there's going to be some networking afterwards, come up and talk to these people and ask them, you know, your, uh, ask them about your, uh, uh, about your uh, uh, particular interests. And finally, I'll say one thing. The deadline to register to vote for the referendum is June the 7th. Uh, and there are still huge numbers of uh, the, 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 uh, huge numbers of the electorate who are not yet registered. Uh, if, you, if, you're not uh, uh, if you're not registered by June the 7th, you won't get a vote on June the 23rd. Thanks, Andrew. Well, the uh, observant of you will notice that uh, there is another straw poll. Before we do that, though, I'm just going to ask each of our panellists to give us a very quick, i.e. no more than 30 seconds, summary of why they're arguing the way they are. And I'm going to do it in the uh, reverse batting order that uh, we started with, which means, Graham, you go first. I think there are risks on either side of remaining in. If we remain in, the European Union will go in its same direction. We will be outside the core project of the EU, which will end up being all but the United Kingdom and Denmark in the euro. So there are real threats to us of being oppressed in terms of policy uh, development and being regularly outvoted. Thank well, you. That, that is 30 seconds. Sorry, I said I'd be strict on this. Liz. Well, as I say, I, I think the process of leaving would be a major distraction and we'd end up uh, in a much worse position. I, looking at all the different models that um, might take place after Brexit, most of them, if we, in dealing with the EU, we would anyway have to accept their rules and uh, 
free movement of people. So a lot of the reasons that, that people don't like it would still apply to us. OK, that's 30 seconds. Thank okay. you. Nick? Um, I guess, number one, I'm passionate about the youth of this country. I think we're, I think we're in a, got an incredible role in the world to fulfil, and I want to see and I want to see us starting to lead, not follow. I'm bored of kicking the can down the road. I mean, with the financial crisis, I think it's about time that we, rather than back failing institutions, we actually fight to amend them. And I believe that we can, by, by voting to leave, we will, we will fix this far faster than if we stay. And I think, in summary, the last thing I'll say is that the risks are far less than anyone thinks. All right, thank you, Nick. Dinesh, your 30 seconds, please. Well, our un unemployment rate here is 5%. All, most of Europe is over 10%. We have a great economy and we're feeding off Europe with all its markets and we should remain because we feel, I feel, that we can do a much better job because on, the online directive is still not in uh, and we're a services country and when that comes in, we're really going to motor.